Yes, thank you very much for your interest in uh, this day's lightning talks. I am Seefischer. I'm only sitting here. The real work was done by Zeltofil, who's not visible, but uh, who did all the scheduling and called hundreds of people and emailed uh, figuratively thousands of people. <laughs> Yeah, some quick notes. We still need a lot of lightning talks, especially for tomorrow. Tomorrow there will be lightning talks at the same time as today, or maybe at uh, 4 p.m. flat, in the best case. And um, if you want to present your project, if you want to present something cool you did at your hackerspace or at home, or that you did in politics, something you drew, some art you're doing, some instrument you're playing, you can get your five minutes of fame at the lightning talks. Just submit it. The instructions are all on the wiki. You can find it when you look for lightning talks. It's just an email and a PDF upload of your slides, and we'll be very happy to host you tomorrow. Every lightning talk will be recorded and streamed, so you can enjoy your glory years later by watching it on media.ccc.de. Some quick notes for the speakers today. Please, if uh, your talk is next, you can see it from the schedule on the wiki, and you should all, uh, also have gotten an email that tells you your position. Please come behind the stage, sit in the chair that is provided for you, and when the speaker that talks before you finishes, just come right on stage, come here, adjust the microphone, you can talk into it, and then start your talk. Please repeat questions you're being asked if the uh, person from the audience who's asking didn't step up to the microphone. To the people from the audience, please step up to the microphone to ask questions and ideally already line up during the talk so that we don't lose any time. For the speakers, I will uh, play your slides on this computer. Please just uh, give me a quick nod or say next when I shall advance your slides and then everything's going to work out. So, maybe our oh. first speaker is already here. I, th I think the timekeeping device here I don't have to explain. Just a note for the speakers. Your speaking time does not end when the green line is on, on, the, on the top. Because if, if I show you, you have five minutes. And so, let's, let's do this fast forward. The green line will rise up during the first four minutes of your talk. So if it's on top, like this is in a few seconds, then you still have one minute left. Then during the yellow phase, these are the first 30 seconds of your one minute that is left. And when it's get red, then you have 30 seconds left and now you are within the last second. So you don't need to rush. You have five minutes, not only four minutes. Yes, our first uh, talk will be given by uh, Keita Lopez, who's talking about the right to dream. Please give her a warm welcome. So um, I'm going to show you some slides and I'm going to talk about the project that I've been uh, filming in the last year. It's in... It's about the... It's about the first case worldwide of cost free, as free assignments of GCM frequencies. And this extraordinary thing is happening in Oaxaca, in Mexico, uh, where some people... Uh, working with a Mexican community, indigenous community from a region, it's called Oaxaca in Mexico, and it's one of the poorest regions of the country. Uh, now they have this free range of network of GCM. And uh, if you want, you can, the slide, ah, okay. It's, uh, this documentary is, uh, it's a travel. It's a travel about uh, the knowledge, the open knowledge that, uh, make be, that made possible 
Uh, that uh, this technology now is uh, developing and is using for people in rural areas of Mexico that uh, before of this technology arrived then there was not other kind of uh, GCM networks because uh, no, any, no one private industry was interested uh, to, to supply them these connections. As you can see in the, in the slides, it's uh, a very rural area uh, where all the people is uh, eating all they cultivated, and uh, even in this people in this area, the people doesn't doesn't speak uh, Spanish. They speak Zapotec, uh, Mije, and other kind of indigenous region, or indigenous languages. Also, this area um, they works in a, in assemblies where uh, they decided the, the things. They still don't have. Uh, uh, par political parties in these villages and they organize by themselves in assemblies and uh, in this pre-Hispanic uh, uh, pre pre uh, st structures. So the point is that uh, could be some strength, but uh, these people uh, share a lot of things with the uh, eti uh, hacker ethics about uh, how to share things and about the uh, open knowledge. They, for example, have one thing that is called techio, that it, seem, uh, uh, it means that you have to work for the community and you have to share these things. So, as you see in the photos, there are uh, extracted frames. So, in this area, uh, with this uh, extraordinary situation about the political organization, uh, arrives one or organization that is called Rizomatica who is uh, building these uh, GSM networks and is like a, some kind of do-it-yourself telecoms. You can see in the images, uh, well, some different images, these guys uh, are um, assembling these antennas and at the same time they are collaborating and working with the people in the communities. And uh, it's really funny because uh, in this moment that the, th the people start to, to work with each other, they really learn about the experience they, from one and to another. The people of these communities decide how do they want to manage the communications and how to work with the limits and how to manage it. They decided to, put, uh, to set up a small amount of money each uh, month and uh, this is the, the cost of the telephony. You can call inside of the village and uh, this is the, the price to make all the calls. If you want to call outside, you need to, um, to give another amount of money, and this is uh, using a VoIP technology. So, the documentary is a, in, still in production. Uh, we are going to launch a campaign in October, and we, are, uh, we came here to show some images to talk about and maybe to find some kind of feedback or even we bring some t-shirt to, to sell and, and we wanted to share this, kind, this small piece of, of history. Uh, could you be a little bit more fast? Sorry. So, wait, one moment. All people know... Uh, the, the another one? Yeah, the telephone? Yeah. No. Yeah, that one. Um, all people know Mexico, all people know Ayotzinapa, all people know all the things that uh, are happening. But the point is that now the technology in this country uh, is entering in some of these areas like a decolonization uh, technology. It's not the, uh, a big uh, enterprise who is going there. Maybe you know about Carlos Slim, who is the, mo the richest person in the world. So he is the owner of all the telecom, uh, all the telecoms in Mexico, the, the biggest telecoms. So this, this story is also about, uh, you know, Goliath, the small against the, how are we? Oh. against the small. It's an observational documentary. It's not uh, that I am uh, entering in, into the field and provoking things. As you can see, for example, in this image, no, no, it's uh, all the networks are using uh, the languages of these own villages. This language is Mije, so because the people of the, the, of the villages decided that this is the, the language that need to be used.
Thanks a lot. Our next speaker is uh, Freak, talking about tlscompare.org. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Martin. Freak is my Twitter handle. Um, I'm going to talk about TLS Compare today because I think it's an interesting experiment that uh, we did back in Vienna. Um, next slide, please. So one of the, I'm probably sure you all know TLS and you know what it does and what it can do. Uh, one of the problems with TLS is that it's not that widespread uh, in use as it could be or it should be. Um, so passive observering, dragnet surveillance, those are all very common threats on, on the internet. Uh, HTTPS would be perfectly uh, securing it and making it harder to attack. So one of the problems is it's not used enough. Uh, there are two really good projects from the EFF. Uh, one is Let's Encrypt and the other one is HTTPS Everywhere. Uh, I really re recommend you to watch the talk of Peter Eckersley on Let's Encrypt uh, on Monday, I think, in the afternoon, uh, because this will change the entire HTTPS ecosystem, which is really a game changer. Uh, and the other slide is, uh, the other project is Let's Encrypt uh, HTTPS Everywhere, which is a browser extension which m manages a rule set uh, to upgrade website connections to TLS where available. Um, you can download it for almost every platform, and if you use a browser, you definitely should install it because it makes um, uh, encryption more pervasive and more expensive uh, to, to attack. Next slide, please. So what we did, and in particular uh, to students of mine, Dominic and Willy, um, we tried to automate the process of creating rules for HTTPS everywhere. So right now it's a manually maintained set of about 10,000 rules. And we started with the idea, okay, we have Alexa, one million websites. How many of them support HTTPS and how many of them uh, deliver the same content? So the first thing we did is to crawl the Alexa top one million on both ports for HTTP and HTTPS. Uh, and then we had the problem, we had to compare those two websites and to see if, if they're equal uh, or not, and if they're equal to, to generate a rule for HTTPS everywhere. Um, problem is, dynamic content is really tricky, so websites that look similar can be totally different uh, and vice versa, so you really have to uh, have different metrics in place to compare uh, the websites, and uh, this is where tlscompare.org uh, comes into place. Next slide, please. So two of the most promising metrics we had are uh, shown in the figure. You can clearly see that there are a lot of websites which are probably the same, um, and a lot of which are definitely not the same. Next slide, please. Um, and the problem with those 120,000 rules that we created is, for one, uh, it crashes the browser because the browser extension is not manageable uh, for such a large uh, rule set, uh, and it's automatically generated, so we really need some uh, effort to manually verify those rules and to see uh, if those rules make sense or not. So this is where tlscompare.org comes into place. You can see a screenshot. Um, it's really easy. It has three buttons in the regular mode, so you click uh, the middle button and say you want to compare two websites. Next slide, please. Uh, and then two windows pop up where you can visually compare those pages and uh, can then click the green or the red, uh, the yellow button uh, if they are factorially the same websites uh, or not. Next slide, please. Uh, we also have an expert mode, so if you uh, know what the 404 error is or if you know what um, uh, mis mixed content warning is, then you should check out the expert mode. It has much more detailed information uh, you can provide. Um, and what we are hoping to do with this platform is to, to make the, the most popular parts of the web uh, protected by HTTPS everywhere. So right now there are a lot of rules in there, um, but we could really add another 10,000, like doubling the size of the rule set um, with not that much cost. So if everybody goes to tlscompare.org and ha clicks five times, um, next slide please, uh, then we can uh, really blow up this rule set until uh, Let's Encrypt uh, is ready for uh, rolling out. So please, um, 
go to TLS, compare to .org, uh, have a look. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we'd be happy to, I'd be happy to answer questions. Most of the times I'm uh, at Leivandville, right uh, outside of the tent, so you can find me there. Uh, but you can also find me on, on, next slide please, you can also find me on Twitter. Uh, the whole project is on Twitter, uh, and I'd be happy to, to get any feedback or uh, a lot of evaluations uh, from you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next up is uh, the person who originally was meant to go first, namely Stevek, 99. Hello. My name is Michael, I'm 28 years old, four and a half years in the UK, and I had my first psychedelic experience in 2008, and ever since I've been tripping. Basically, I imagine what would happen if anything was possible, and I was to Ozora, boom, Burning Man, and now I'm here, and I want to keep this spirit with me at all times. I am determined to buy a land in the southern Portugal and establish a permanent, permanent, permaculture, harvest energy from the sun, harvest water from the ocean, using process of reverse osmosis, have infinite amount of energy, infinite amount of fresh water, and using beautiful nature, have delicious, organic, organically grown food. This is a perfect place for hacking environment, and for many years, it wasn't possible because of the money, because of money this, money this, money that. And when I was traveling, uh, I'm originally from Poland. Uh, most of you are from Germany. There was like many differences in terms of, uh, yes, there were, there, there were some differences, but it's, it's not about the differences. It's about uh, being open to new opportunities, new possibilities. Me living in London, I have finally financial opportunity to either buy the land in a two, after two years of work, this is just me working for two years buying a land, or I can invest this money. I have a plan, rent a house with a large garden and some parking space. I invite you, all you guys, you and you and you, to come and visit me in my new place in London and just start creating foundation because the genesis, what does it mean? Genesis is the beginning, source, origin. RE, just like renew, reset, restart. And technology is there, future is there. The, the future is now, it's basically, it is happening and Sometimes I was thinking, ah, someone will do this, someone will make it happen, but in rea reality is, every one of us creates this festival, and I don't want to wait another four years to make this happen. I won't have this feeling with me at all times. We, London is a beautiful place. I need to admit it is expensive, and when I first moved uh, in 2011, I was living on a squat, I had no money at all, and it is tough. I decided that uh, money is no longer an issue, money is no longer an object, and I make a decisions based on value. And we have a mission to make, and in the last few seconds, I just invite you to visit the web website, genesis.re. Of course, it was hacked, uh, just like everything on the Hacker Festival, but it is no cookies, no tracking, no JavaScript, just a little bit of a plain text explaining, explaining what I have to say right here, right now. And uh, this is a beautiful visionary artwork of uh, Alexander Ward, who is my friend. And I wish you best of luck on this journey. Be excellent to each other. Uh, Genesis.re is the site I would like you to visit. Uh, basically, this is it. Have an excellent festival, and I wish you best of luck in this journey. Thank you very much. Next up is a short public service announcement. 
Yeah, um, most people of you will already have heard it. This is for those who just came in. Please make sure, if you're not sure if your tent is really secured and everything is watertight, please go to your tent and secure it. We're expecting a bit of gusty wind, nasty gusty wind and a bit of rain, so uh, keep your stuff secured, please. And another announcement for me to the people who just came in. We're still looking for lightning speakers for tomorrow, so if you have a project to present, please just go to the wiki page about lightning talks, submit a PDF with your slides, and be talking at this spot at this time tomorrow. Thank you. And next up is MS Crox talking about machine learning. Welcome, MS Crox. Hello, hello, everyone. I am Matthew, and I'm, I am from London. And when I'm in London, I spend most of my time doing maths. And I'm going to talk to you about one bit of maths that I think is very interesting. Um, so I'm going to tell you today about MENIS, which stands for the Machine Educable Noughts and Crosses Engine. Next slide, please. Um, so not, MENIS was built by Donald Mitchie in 1960. Um, he'd previously, previously worked at Bletchley Park with Alan Turing during the war and broke the Tunney Code when he was there. And this is sort of a while after 1960. And he built MENIS out of 304 matchboxes. Next slide. And next slide. So that, those are two pictures of Menace. This is a close-up version. You can see, hopefully, there are a lot of matchboxes. Each max box, box has one noughts and crosses position drawn on it, um, a triangle of cardboard at the bottom, and some counts inside. And how you play against Menace is you take the matchbox for the position you're currently playing in, you give it a shake, you open it, and whichever counter comes to the bottom tells you where to play next. Menace can also only go first. Um, to reduce the number of matchboxes, it only plays first. So I'm going to play an example game against Menace now. Next slide, please. Um, so, Menace is playing as noughts, we're playing as crosses. So, first of all, I pick the first box, I give a shake, I open it, and we get a red counter. And a red counter means play there. Um, now the human play, player plays, and the human player might play here. Now we take the next box, which has this position on it. We give it a shake, we open it, and then it tells us to play there. Then we, human player plays here. Then we take the box with that position drawn on it. We give it a shake, we open it. The green tells us to play here. Um, then the human player plays here. Um, we take the box with that position on it. We give it a shake, we open it. We get that color. It tells us to go there. Human player, go there. And now the human player has won. Um, so this is a game you might play against Menace earlier on when it hasn't done much learning. And now it needs to do some learning. So you take away the four marbles that were open there, you close the boxes, and you put them back. And now, one of the problems that Menace had there was, at this point, it moved in the right middle, which was a really bad move, because it let, again, it let the human player do this when it had a double win and is going to win always. So by taking the marbles out, Menace has now learned that that was a bad move, and it will do it less often. Next, please. Um, and there's a few more positions, three more things you need to know. Um, so if you lose, you take one marble out. If you draw, you put one marble, one extra marble of that color in. And if you win, you put three extra marbles in. And in this way, um, Menace very quickly learns how to at least draw with good players at Noughts and Crosses. Um, and after about 20 or 30 games, it should be consistently drawing with you. Um, next slide. Um, okay, so this week at CCC, I've been quite busy during the siestas um, programming. I have made a JavaScript implementation of this, which I've put on my website. So if anyone would like to play against Menace, um, the URL is there. Um, thank you for listening. The URL is there again. I guess I have questions. Thank you for speaking. We still have time for a few questions. Anyone? No questions, then thanks for speaking, and have a great time. Next up is uh, Peggy. So a rem reminder, if you decide to have questions, you see how many time we have left for a speaker, then please go to the microphone, and you can ask your question directly. Hi, I'm Peggy. I uh, speak about Flab uh, Flabber Berlin, which is a new initiative from uh, Berlin, from the Ka Chaos Machschule which is uh, actually the school uh, part of the CCC, which is uh, emphasized on hands-on technologies, uh, some knowledge about uh, data security and media competence. So uh, what we realize uh, quite a lot at schools that uh, tools like WhatsApp are really very well known and really very uh, loved. 
but uh, what you see is there's something behind which is not so lovely, which shows uh, Bern das Brot. I don't know if it's if you can see the movie. Yes, we can. I have a short movie. Oh, no sound? No sound. Okay, it explains actually um, how uh, social networks suck more and more people into it. So, do you want to have a friend? I can give you thousands of friends. So, uh, I don't want to have friends, uh, but it doesn't care. And it's very, it's quite funny made, actually. Yeah, sound? You can learn even from German television. Gratuliere, Bernd. Du bist jetzt online. Du hast jetzt 687 Freunde, Bernd. Du solltest... Du bist jetzt online. Gratuliere, Bernd. Du bist jetzt online. Du hast jetzt 687 Freunde, Bernd. Du solltest ihnen etwas posten. Wenn ich posten will, werde ich Briefträger. Was soll der Quatsch? Wenn ich posten will, werde ich Briefträger. Wassermarsch. Danke. Oh! Uh, ganz kurz eigentlich Thema. Uh, oh, no, I switched to German. Sorry. Um, it's actually about how children, especially children, are uh, li likely to be by their friends involved more and more into social networks. So what we actually want is, okay, you have your social networks, but please use other tools. Use secure open source tools. And we are now at the point that it's not so... Um, bad, uh, not so difficult to, to get into it. So our philosophy is actually based on that uh, data security is a human right. We have a right of privacy. Children have to learn and they have to be aware of it. And we follow the hacker philosophy like... Um, ah, my God. Um, let's, yeah, okay, so uh, distrust authorities and um, which is actually uh, quite a big deal when you go to schools because it means it's actually a clash. So all your distrust authorities and you make a community of sharing and caring knowledge. So how do you control knowledge? So in the end, it's something like we rethink the, the structure of school and we make this um, experiment to put it into the communities that um, that say everybody can share knowledge, can uh, have a calendar, can um, use something like own cloud for file sharing, can communicate, uh, have an address book, and all these kind of things. What you use for daily communication, you can also use for school communication, and it does doesn't make the border between teachers, uh, pupils, parents. And we open up actually the whole idea of school, at, uh, as especially in Germany, is a very uh, strict, hierarchical, organized organization. So we made a first fluid toolset. So it's not about to propagand this toolset. It's about to think about what tools you can use. So, for example, Open Fire as a server, um, Own Cloud, uh, Jitsi for video for me, which is also in, uh, possible to encrypt, uh, Etherpads for uh, uh, working together on documents, and Chat Secure for chatting. And then we want to put it in two existing communities in schools, like, for example, uh, engaged pupils um, or uh, parents which are organized or engaged um, teachers. And um, if you want to support us, I know, for example, Tactical Techs have a very similar uh, idea, but on an international way for NGOs, please, people like uh, Tactical uh, Tactical Tech, come to us, 
write to us, give your, um, uh, give, you can support us by developing the idea and, um, uh, administrate, technically, and whatever. We are open for everything, uh, what you want to communicate. So we have even a pad. So if you have any ideas, just open uh, the pad, put it on it, put your links, put your inspiration, put your critics, everything. We, I'm happy. We are happy, very happy when, when you say anything or you contact, uh, contact us by email at contact at Flubber Berlin. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is CC3E talking about Q6. General recommendation on telephone switching and signaling. International, automatic and semi-automatic working. Advantages of international automatic working. ITUT recommendation Q.6. Extract from the Blue Book. New Delhi, 1960. The CCITT, considering that the advantage of semi-automatic working mentioned in recommendation Q.5 apply as well to automatic working in respect of reliability, associate efficiency, and the satisfaction given to subscribers. That the advantages of automatic working are even greater as regards staff economy, since outgoing operators are dispensed with. That the changeover from semi-automatic to automatic working may be accomplished without any major modification on the international circuits or the switching equipment at transit and incoming exchanges. That by 1960, the above advantages had been widely confirmed by experience on a number of international relations, which had been using automatic service up to that time. But such experience has also shown that when relation changes from demand working, manual or semi-automatic, to automatic working, there is a considerable increase in traffic. That the introduction of an international automatic service follows logically on the introduction of a national automatic service draws the attention of the administrations to the additional advantages resulting from the introduction of an international automatic service. <laughs> Thank you for your careful attention. And you can follow us on Twitter. Thanks a lot. Next up is Jack Singleton talking about open web apps. Did you plan on showing a web app? Uh, I was going to try, but if you don't... Yeah, unfortunately, we can't do that. That's fine. I'll just talk. OK. So you get to hear about open web apps. You don't get to see them. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, my experience with a project called Sandstorm. Uh, Sandstorm is an open source platform for self-hosting web applications. Uh, you don't have to host applications for yourself. You can also host them for other people. So we're hopeful that this project will let organizations host, uh, host like alternatives to Google Docs, as well as individuals with their own data. Um, so, so who am I? Uh, I'm not a core developer of Sandstorm, but I picked up Sandstorm and wrote an app for it. Uh, so if you have any serious questions, I'd recommend going to a core member of the team. But uh, as for the experience you might have building an application for Sandstorm, you can ask me. Uh, next slide. So, so before I talk about Sandstorm specifically, I want to talk about Unix, because I think everyone here will know a little bit about Unix. And in Unix, we have, uh, we have lots of small programs. And the OS gives us a lot. Uh, the OS gives us user management. We have document management with the file system. Um, we get a lot of stuff for free, and for me that's really nice because I can sit down at my laptop and write a script, and there's very little I have to do in order to get something usable. Uh, and in fact, all I really have to do is translate standard in to standard out. If I want to do more, I can, but that's the minimum. In the modern web, we have a different situation, and application developers are responsible for everything. If you have an idea and you want to get that out to lots of people quickly, first you have to implement user management, document management, permissions, deployment, and then you've got to take care of all of the security. 
And that's not something you do once, that's something you do, and then you get a pager at 3 a.m. and you have to wake up and patch servers. So it's a big barrier to, uh, to entry uh, in order to develop an open web application. Um, so, so on with desktop software, we have this uh, we have this uh, thing with Microsoft Word and LibreOffice, and the people in this room will tell everyone, "Oh, use LibreOffice, don't use proprietary software." But what do we have for Google Docs? We don't have anything right now, and I think this is a problem. So Sandstorm is a platform which is Apache 2 licensed. Uh, you can run apps in Linux containers and it's hosted by anybody. It could be hosted by yourself under your bed, or it could be hosted by an organization that you actually trust, unlike an organization like Google. Um, so the, the, the application that I wrote for Sandstorm is called Hacker Slides. It's really, really simple. All of the credit goes to Ace Editor and Reveal.js, which are two great projects. All I wanted to do is have both of those in a browser window, and then sync them up nicely. So that's what I did. It took me a couple of days. And there's a lot of stuff that I didn't have to do when I wrote that. I didn't have to do all of this login stuff. I didn't have to do document management because the platform hosts, uh, does this for me. Uh, all that said, I still got a full Linux environment and I still got to pick my uh, technology stack because Sandstorm runs apps in Linux containers. So you don't have to use a PHP API or something that you really would rather not use. Um, and because I'm not hosting this application for people, it means that I don't stay up all night worrying about security, worrying about how I'm going to patch the next heart bleed when it comes out at 3 a.m. So weather permitting, we'll be having a workshop after these lightning talks. It actually won't be at 1700, it'll be at 1800, which is when this whole session ends. Uh, come by and talk to us about Sandstorm, talk to us about ideas that you have, and uh, if you're interested, you can ask me about the applications that I'm developing. Thanks. Thank you very much. We might still have time for a question. It's, I really can't see the audience at all, so if you have a question, just step up and ask it. Cool. No questions, then thanks a lot. Next up is Yannick talking about manufacturing electronics fast and low cost. Hello, Yannick. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks you for joining me. In the next five minutes, I'd like to talk to you about a project we did um, in the Brussels University uh, this spring. Next slide, please. Um, not sure which of you are, have studied in university, but in engineering school, uh, informatics is kind of a mandatory thing. And yeah, it's not really inspiring. Here you see some typical examples of um, programming assignment students get. Uh, it's pretty obvious that these are not really the most motivating assignments. Next slide, please. Uh, which uh, results in motivation sinking and disappearing faster than the rate of MATE here at CCC. Uh, coincidentally, uh, students really need this kind of knowledge uh, to progress further, so we were looking for the causes of this problem. And the problem is that we are actually teaching them to program, but without a real purpose. We're giving them assignments, but we're not giving them a task. So we thought, well, instead of giving them just programming assignments, let's give them um, a real purpose, like giving them a piece of external hardware they could drive, or giving them a piece of uh, device they need to uh, extract data from. Next slide, please. Now, the problem is uh, that there is so much stuff online already. If you take any piece of existing hardware, yeah, you find lots of documentation. And yeah, I'm looking at the Arduino guys. Thank you. Uh, so it's really impossible to give any assignment at all uh, without students easily finding solutions online. And if they just have to copy a GitHub repository, yeah, then it's not really an assignment, obviously. Uh, so, well, what's the easy solution? Let's develop our own hardware. Uh, well, it's an improvised project, so there were a few minor issues. There was no budget, no time, no manpower. So these are actually quite clear indications that the project may go wrong. But since we're insane, we thought it was a great challenge, so let's go along with it. Next slide. So, 
the idea was really simple. Let's take a few really cheap sensors, wag them on a board, and let's call it a weather station. And the weather station can then monitor a few variables. Students can extract it and display it in a nice interface. So we put a microcontroller on it, microcontroller, process the data, send it over UART to USB. Students connected their um, board to their computer, and they could read out the data. Yep. Next slide. Uh, so there's a prototype. And of course, I have it with me here. Um, it's really simple uh, and not so hard to manufacture. You only have to make one, but we had to make it for all our students, which were 60 students at a time. So instead of soldering one, we were thinking of large-scale implementations, and we never did that before. So we had to find it out, and that in a time frame of six weeks. Yeah, not that easy. Next slide. So, how do you do this? Well, you design it to be easy, manufacturable. Take easy to source parts, make sure that the board is really easy to manufacture, that it is not too expensive. Boards are actually pretty easy to uh, obtain and not that expensive if you order them in some certain Asian country, which I won't mention. Uh, however, the assembly, so the soldering of the parts, is an expensive task. Um, and we had to think of solutions for that. Next slide. So we already had a soldering oven, we had a stencil machine, no problem about that, but how are you going to solder all these parts on 60 individual boards? It's like 50 parts times 60 boards at a whole lot of components, and lately, in modern electronics, these parts are extremely small, you can barely see them. And if they're landing on your desk and you sneeze and you suddenly have 3,000 capacitors laying on the floor, which is not really such a nice thing to have. So yeah, how are we going to place these components on the board? We were lucky to find a real pick and place machine somewhere in a storage room. And that is quite suspicious. Why would you put it in a storage room? And it turned out that, well, it was a really nice Chinese machine and the manual was also written in perfect Chinese. Um, the driver software was equally user friendly. Uh, and one of the nozzles was missing and a reel was broken. So first thing to do, well, little side project. Uh, within these six weeks we had, we had to develop our own driver software for this machine, which we eventually managed. Next slide. Uh, this is the machine uh, in action. Uh, the boards arrived one day before deadline. So one day before we actually had to deliver the boards, we were manufacturing them. And we still had the whole night to write the documentation about it. So, well, really great on time. So to conclude, what did you learn from this? Well, you can actually manufacture electronics yourself if you respect a few basic ideas and use your mind. I have a few boards to hand out, so if you like to talk to uh, the project about me, join me at the Belgian village uh, for a drink um, or a discussion about weather stations. Thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Is there time? No. OK, sorry. Thanks a lot. Next up will be NF talking about the internet in Iran. And hey. Hello. Um, I'm NF. I'm from Australia. I came a long way to be at camp. How awesome is camp? Come on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so I just wanted to talk briefly about the internet in Iran. Um, I just want to say I'm not an expert on the Middle East or even the internet. I'm just a, a nerd that went there and I thought you might be interested in what I found. Um, so I don't know what your ideas of what Iran is now, but it's a religious country. We all know that. It has a conservative government. If you read the papers, you know that. They have these draconian social laws. Women have to dress modestly. You can't sing and dance in public and so on. Um, and of course, foreign sanctions imposed by the West have crippled the country industrially and economically. Um, but it's also quite different to what I expected. Um, it's, it, there's a really large and growing middle class in Iran that are highly educated, um, and they tend to be very progressive. Like, while they identify ostensibly as Muslim, um, they also tend to identify with other religions, and some of them are even secular. Um, and of course, they're very interested in the outside world. Um, and also, contrary to my expectations, um, it was an incredibly safe and friendly environment. I've been to nearly 40 countries, and of all the countries I've visited, it was by far the, the safest and most friendly country that I visited. Um, so the government is, is very controlling of the media, um, and that's probably the topic of a whole other talk. But, of course, part of that is controlling the Internet. Um, 
And so in Iran, internet access is everywhere, um, like in many countries. Every hotel I visited had the net. Everyone I met had internet access at home. Um, and of course, you can get 3G coverage in most cities. And internet access is cheap. Um, but it's also slow. By law, they're required to limit internet connections to 128 kilobits, I guess, to, uh, to limit the amount of influence that can come down the pipe. Um, but the internet use in Iran is growing at a huge rate. Um, if you try to access a forbidden sort of resource, this is the screen that you, that you see. It redirects you to this site, and it has basically a list of recommendations. So if you try to look up, so that, try to access Facebook, it recommends you to some other um, Iranian government site related to, to social networking. Or if you try to access pornography, it will offer you some spiritual guidance. Um, and so to make this possible, they operate a great firewall, um, much like China, although it's a bit different, I suppose. Um, they practice a request hijacking of HTTP, they poison DNS to redirect common sites, and um, they block various hosts and ports outright. Um, so all of this interception makes regular HTTP quite slow, um, so if you use HTTPS, it's much faster. Um, I, I sort of looked around at what was blocked, and unsurprisingly, Facebook, Twitter, um, they were blocked, Reddit, source of all evils blocked, uh, YouTube, GitHub, um, even the BBC was blocked. Um, and I also noticed that in visiting various news sites, if the URL contained a bad word, like I, I clicked on an, a, a news article about a, a rape, and that was blocked. So they, they actually inspect the requests, and you can access the rest of the site, but not those URLs. And also the common VPN protocols also outright blocked. Um, what was not blocked was Google. Google web searches worked, Gmail worked, Instagram worked, um, and the New York Times worked, which I thought was strange considering the BBC was blocked. Um, most HTTPS sites worked pretty well. Um, SSH worked to various hosts that I tried. And also the OpenVPN protocols um, worked, which was great. Um, so if you want to bypass the firewall in Iran, um, you should use a VPN. As I said, you can't use LTTP or PPTP. Um, and many devices, like iPhones and Android devices, only support those natively out of the box, so that's kind of disappointing. Um, but use OpenVPN. You can use SSH tunneling, but the latency tends to be pretty bad, um, so uh, try and avoid it if you can. Um, but interestingly, a lot of the foreign VPN endpoints are not blocked. Um, so if you sign up for VPN in advance, you can access those. You can also use various CGI proxies, um, like various free sites let you, let you bounce through them, but of course you can't log into your personal stuff that way, or, you, or the man in the middle of you. Um, I talked to a lot of Iranians about how they access the internet, um, and one of the major stumbling blocks for them is they can't pay for VPN services like we can because sanctions prevent them from owning credit cards. Um, but there are actually many foreign-run VPNs or proxies that they use, um, and everyone seems to have this friend who knows how to set up the VPN for them. Um, I found that the effects of the censorship were pretty neutered. The middle class tends to know a lot about the outside world. A lot of everyone I spoke to wanted to add me on Facebook and Instagram, and many people talked to me about pirated Western movies that they'd seen, so the information clearly wants to be free. Um, there's a lot of awful stuff that happens in Iran, like the government monitors um, various social networking and stuff to find dissidents and persecute them. Um, people get questioned when they return to Iran about their use of Facebook and are forced to log in and show them what they've done. And also, the US sponsors an, anonym, an anonymizer proxy service that Iranians can use. So they're in, in the interests of Iranians having privacy, contrary to their own citizens, I guess. Um, so if you go to Iran, set up your VPN in advance, enjoy the amazing people, sites, and food, and bring money for carpets. Um, I only had a bit. I should have brought more. Thank you very much. So to everyone who just entered the lightning talks, uh, we have a slight delay of 20 minutes, but we will bring all the talks, we have enough time for this, and we even, how awesome is this, have translations for lightning talks. So if you want or need a translation, just dial in 8012 and you will get English talks translated to German and vice versa. Thank you. Next up is Algoldor talking about the food hacking days now. Okay, Algoldor, are you here to talk? It's your spot now. If not, then we'll reduce our delay by skipping the stop at Wolfsburg and continuing with uh, Metfreak109. Is he there? 
Have I missed? No. Okay, I'm sorry. You are next. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Do you have slides? Yeah, the Megas 55. Oh, Megas. Oh, good. <laughs> That's a great coincidence. Then yes, enjoy. Hi. Um, I'm here to introduce to you um, the recreation of the holy grail of 8-bit computing. Um, you can tell about that there are two holy grails, one being the very first 8-bit computer that has been sold, that's the Apple One, that's been gone for about one million dollars, something like this, but I'm talking about the, the machine that got at the end of the 8-bit era. A slide, please. This is this one. It's called the Kiomara 65. It was a planned successor of the C64. Slide, please. And um, you might say, okay, the 128 was the successor, but um, this one was a computer that had an extra mode and was 100% uh, backward compatible. This one um, is a bit different because it has a lot more power than the uh, original one and claims to be about 70-80% compatible, more on an AP level than on the low level of the hardware. That gives you access to uh, some really, really cool 8-bit hardware, probably the coolest 8-bit hardware that's ever been made. Slide, please. We are trying to recreate this one using an FPGA design. Um, the CPU is about 45 times faster than the original C64 was. The C65 was about three times faster than the original C64. Um, we've got full HDMI 1200p display, uh, not using a, a frame buffer, but really uh, the original way um, the graphics were displayed on C64 and C65. Um, we've got some additional new hardware like Ethernet port or uh, micro SD storage. We've got uh, also some stuff that the original C65 um, does not include, like enhanced sprites and a few other stuff. Slide, please. Um, if you think that this is cool, um, or why, do, why are we doing this? We are doing this um, because it is. Um, the recreation of something that has been built for uh, just about 200 up to 2,000 models. They are only prototypes available and we want to complete this task on having a complete system that you can put on your desktop and have the coolest 8-bit hardware you ever can get. And it's also intended to use for, for teaching because um, I would say um, understanding a computer back then was much more easy uh, at this time. And um, also, um, Paul, who did the, the, initialized the whole stuff, um, wanted to have an 8-bit com, uh, computer he could do SSH with, so he's safe from the NSA. Okay, slide, please. Um, what we have right now is a system that largely works. As Paul put it this way, um, think of the um, Death Star in Return of the Jedi. The big cannon works, but there are something like the toilet doors that can, when you open it, suck you out into space. So. It's a, the real machine works, but there are a lot of uh, tiny things to take care of. And um, the whole machine is about um, uh, the real part done. Slide, please. Um, what's still missing? Yeah. Whole of, of these little stuff. We are also um, cr uh, trying to recreate the original casing uh, in a way that will work with our, with our uh, design board. Um, and we want to have um, uh, man, you need good eyes up here. Um, yeah, um, also um, to have a, a board that is um, contains all the I/O ports of the original hardware, and also uh, sockets for the original sound chips, which are some very special chips. You can uh, when you try to buy them on eBay, they get real pricey. Uh, you can put them in there uh, instead of the FPGA recreation of the original one. Slide, please. So if you want to participate, we need uh, FPGA developer. We need people who know how to build cases. Um, we need guys who like to uh, work on the firmware of the machine. So something like uh, accessing the SD card can work from the 8-bit system. Um, and we are also people who just like to play with it and test it. So, slide please. This is the machine. This is where you can find us. 
and I've brought a prototype with me that will be available for, show and, for showing uh, tomorrow between 1600 and 1800 hours at the Leitstelle right outside the tent here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is uh, Matt Freak 109 talking about bringing hectoculture to schools. Hi. Um, I call in peace, and I say this because I'm kind of incorporating the enemy here, because I'm a government employee. Yay, I teach, so I have been in hacking around for 30 years, and I thought it would be a great idea if we could commit the hackerspace mentality towards schools. So, kind of making people more involved into technology. But first, uh, let's talk a bit about where I come from. Next slide, please. So, where the heck is Luxembourg? I'm originated in Luxembourg, which is the tiny bit of country insert between Belgium, France, and Germany. So, we have a few inhabitants, and we have a very nice um, ground to do experimentation. Next slide, please. So, the Ministry of Education launched something called Digital for Education Project because they all of a sudden discovered that, well, we are missing ICT people. So, they all wanted to do something ICT-ish, and so I came up with the idea, hmm, why not push makerspaces onto schools? So, we created an initiative called Be Creative, B-E Creative, actually, and uh, this aims to establish a field where people can have workshops, people can develop their projects, but can also be sensitized to new technology. So we gather around kids starting from age 10 up to, well, actually there's no limit. We offer them a free access to something called a makerspace, which means that every school should get a room equipped hackerspace-ish, and the access for the students is free of charge. So what it is, it's kind of a hackerspace, but of course you cannot have kids running around without the attention, so we put mentoring on top of it. That means that a teacher, which is a motivated person, yes, he is normally, should be sitting around uh, giving workshops, explaining stuff, and initiating that kind of creativity that we are missing in our schools, because we all know it, school sucks and is boring. So we want to change that. How do we do that? Well, we try to implement a common infrastructure. We try um, to flatten down the hierarchy, meaning that the teacher willing to give workshops is not sitting at the top and the student has to shut up and sit down. But both are more or less equal on one level and should exactly talk to each other and share knowledge and uh, persist in their projects. So, right now, this slide is kind of not accurate. Um, when is this going to happen and where is it happening? Well, right now, as I speak, we count five actual makerspaces opening up in November this year. So, we have one base uh, located at the uh, Luxembourg City, Luxembourg Center, which is a school-independent uh, makerspace that is kind of a hackerspace because it is opened 40 hours um, per week. Whereas the other hacker space, uh, sorry, maker spaces are open as soon as a teacher is having a workshop there. So why are we here and uh, why do I keep on talking like this? Well, we are looking for partnerships. We are looking for hackers who want to help us out with their knowledge, expertise and everything. So we're looking for maybe project ideas or maybe little workshops or stuff that you wanted to teach some kids or maybe you have an idea that we, what we could implement. If that's the case, if you think that you can help us out, you can uh, visit us on one of these websites. We also have uh, Twitter handles, or you can contact me directly. That's my Gmail there, and my Twitter handle is also MacFreak109. Thank you. So maybe if there's a question. Okay, thanks. Thank you, MacFreak. Next up is Paul K talking about liberating mobile devices. All right, so um, let's talk, um, no, sorry, slide please. All right, greetings everyone. So let's talk um, about another view of software on mobile devices. So on the main processor, it all starts with the bootloaders that will then load an operating system that is composed of very different layers. At first you get the Linux kernel that we all know, and then you have hardware abstraction layers that handle various aspects of the hardware. And on top of that, you have frameworks and applications. Next slide, please. 
Um, when it comes to community mobile devices, well, what you get is basically non-free software on those hardware abstraction layers. And this is actually a pretty serious problem. On the first hand, this is a problem for privacy and security, because those non-free blobs actually run on the system and they run as privileged users, so they can access both your data and your communications. So um, sometimes they actually even run as root. So this is a very serious problem. But there is also the fact that uh, those spots being non-free is also um, them denying you some very basic freedom about understanding how it works and understanding how your device works and what it does and enabling you to change it or not. So those community Android versions um, operating systems do not um, care about the bootloaders as well. And those are usually non-free. Um, there, are, there is also software running on various other parts of the device. You have firmware running on integrated circuits, but also a full system running on the modem. And those two aspects are usually non-free as well. And they are a very serious problem for the same reasons, to a lower or higher degree. So this, um, this problem can be solved one step at a time. And the first step to solve it is to create a few fully free operating system. And that's exactly what Replican is. Um, the idea is to replace the non-free parts in the hardware abstraction layers with fully free replacements. And we also want to have a usable system because when we cannot replace uh, those non-free parts, we just won't ship them, but we still want it to work. So we need to have some basic features that are working. And this is actually only a first step for privacy and security because bear in mind that there are still many other ways to spy on the user and there will also be other non-free software running on the device. Um, at this point, at Replicant, we uh, support up to 12 different devices and we have written free software replacement for various aspects of the hardware. And those are even included back in other mobile op operating systems such as Cyanogen Mod and Omni. And we're also working on freeing the bootloaders when it's possible. Um, there are, however, some areas that we do not work on, such as the modem system, firmware, or GPU. Um, some other projects are actually dedicated to freeing those bits. Uh, all right, so we really, really need more people to get involved, so your help is welcome, and it's actually a pretty fun way to learn about low-level hardware hacking. And actually, when I started um, working on that, I had about no clue about what I was doing, and I really learned a lot along the way. So if you're interested in that, well, your help is welcome, you can get involved, and if you cannot uh, spare the time to do it, we also accept donations, and they're uh, welcome as well. So thank you. Um, I'll be giving a longer talk about these issues at the Neo Village um, tomorrow evening, so you're welcome to come and ask questions as well. Um, if you have any now, I would be happy to answer them. Well, no questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Next up is WP Vrak talking about another password manager. Good afternoon, my name is Wynne Almesberger and I'm going to talk about this little project of mine which is called Unlock. Next slide, please. Well, everybody loves passwords, right? That's why there are so many of them. Uh, alone for this camp, for instance, you probably generated something between two and five, four or five passwords that you needed for various registrations and things. So passwords are everywhere and they're not really going away. And of course, to make things a bit uh, more interesting, your passwords should not be too easy, they should not be guessable, so don't, don't use the name of your dog as your password. And also if, if a password database, for instance, gets stolen somewhere, then the password shouldn't be crackable. So your password should also be complicated enough that even a machine cannot crack them. So, but at the same time, it would be very nice if you could actually remember them. Now, that's, that's unlikely that you could do both things at the same time. So, what can you do? Well, you could, for instance, follow the advice of Bruce Schneier and take a piece of paper, write your passwords down and stick them in your wallet. Okay, that's not a bad idea. But then if, if you lose your wallet or somebody steals it, then they also have your passwords and bad things might happen. 
You could store them in a password safe, for instance, on your PC or on your smartphone, and keep them there, so you have them with you where you need them and so on. But then those machines are complex, and they can easily, it can easily happen that bad things happen to those machines, and these things get stolen, and of course the password safe on those machines will be an attractive target. So again, there are risks. Or of course you could store them in the cloud. And let's say Facebook take care of, of managing your access information. Well, you may like this or maybe not. So um, next slide, please. And um, so then the, um, this is now what, what Unlock uh, tries to help with. Um, what Unlock does, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little device about, I have one, I have a prototype, medica, mechanical prototype here, about this size, so about the size of a cigarette lighter. And it's meant to store your personal passwords. It also meant, it's also meant to store passwords that are, that are meant for uh, human use, so things that you would actually type in. So, but perhaps also passwords that are a bit more complicated than this. And it is meant to, uh, to, to be something that, uh, that you can carry around with you everywhere. And um, it keeps the password safe by encrypting them on the internal storage. And one thing that's very important for this type of projects, or for this type of device, is that you can trust it. So, and it's completely open. It is, it, the firmware is open source, the hardware is completely open, uh, schematics and layout. And we also use only open tools. So, for instance, the, the electrical stuff is done with KiCad, which is free software. Um, the, cat wor the cat work is done with FreeCat, which is also free software. And also the development process is completely open. Next slide, please. Close the, this is the oh, should I, up. oh, sorry. And um, so this is, this is, what, this is what, uh, what is in there. Um, you can see in the middle a big OLED. And on the side, there's a capacitive slider. Uh, it's powered by a AAA battery. It has a USB, and it also has uh, a radio interface that should someday uh, speak uh, Bluetooth low energy. Next slide, please. Um, this, uh, this slide shows, gives a quick overview of the internal structure. Um, you have basically two microcontrollers in there, and uh, a system on a chip, a chip that has, that has uh, another tiny microcontroller and a radio interface. Then one microcontroller, the communication microcontroller, takes care of implementing the protocol stacks. And the, the third one is the secure, the secure microcontroller, which takes care of all the, the crypto tasks. It has access to direct access to the display and to the slider, and also to the memory card, where the encrypted information is stored. Um, next slide, please. Now, if you would like to know more about this, then you can find me at the Neo Village, which is just right over there across the street. And you can also go to the, go to the website of the project, that's unlock.com, it's written A-N-E-L-O-K.com. And the project, in this project there are lots of things to do still. There is plenty of opportunity for software developers at a low level, at a medium level, or at a higher level. There are also things that need to be done, uh, for instance, for making the communication between the unlock device and uh, a PC, for instance, if you want to have a web browser that, that when you go to a page and it asks for log information, then the web browser could send something down the stack to unlock and request information. Lots of things to do. Thank you. We have a question from the audience, I believe. No, no question from the audience. Okay, then thank you very much. Next up is Plätzchen talking about the Toda Dojo. And an advice for all speakers and future speakers, please keep the distance between your mouth and the microphone as small as possible, because if you take away the microphone, you will not hear me any longer. Okay. Hi. Uh, we are actually not Plätzchen, we are both. Uh, we are Philip, called Plätzchen, and Nico. We are from the Coda Dojo in Berlin and Potsdam, and we want to talk about the Coda Dojo. So, what is a Coda Dojo? Coda Dojo means you teach kids how to code. So technically, um, we meet once a month on a Saturday for four hours, and um, there are like 40 kids coming, and there are mentors. One mentor has uh, to care about two to three kids, and they then do whatever the kids want to do, and if they're total beginners, we do scratch. So why do we do that? Um, when this whole computer thing came up, we thought, 
uh, that if you want to grow up with the internet or if you grow up with the internet, you learn how it works. And this is nothing new. This just doesn't work. So uh, we need to have a way to spark this curiosity in the kids that how their smartphone, how their tablet, how their anything works. And like this, okay. And we can do this. Okay, and we can do this uh, by letting them code whatever they want. Mostly it's games, and so then they know how games work. So, and we are here, so we want to tell you, do your own code at Dojo. There is no reason why not every hackerspace should have a code at Dojo once a month. Um, and Nico is going to tell you how to do that. <laughs> Thank you. It is uh, very easy to create your own Coda Dojo. You just need a space. You take some time in the week or in the month, and then you invite people to mentor or kids, and that's about it. If you want to have your Coda Dojo listed on the Dojo website, then you just write an email to the people, and they will yeah, link your Coda Dojo. And this is the whole process for you and your kids to learn programming and get into programming. So, and we both do this for, we do this in Berlin for like two years, Potsdam does this for a year. And if you have any questions, if you need any help, uh, go to our Dojo websites that you can find on kodadojo.com and contact us. Um, and if you have other, other questions, um, you can call me at 7524. Uh, and you can grab us at the exit. Thanks. We might still have time for questions if you want to answer any. Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry. <coughs> questions? No questions. Okay, you can find us at the exit. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next up is Dosh talking about writing postcards to hackers in prison. Hello, everyone. Super nice to see so many of you. I heard we're like over 4,500 people here every day sipping on our mate and drinking our beer. And that's wonderful. Lots of you working on great projects. It just saddens me sometimes that there are some people that we wish were here, but they can't. Um, I'm talking about the likes of Chelsea Manning, Jeremy Hammond, Anna Kata, uh, the Sone 9 bloggers in Ethiopia, uh, people in Syria who have been uh, locked away and jailed for things that we all find important. They didn't do it for money, they didn't do it for fame, but they took out and showed the powers that are being abused against all the people in their countries and all in the world. Some of these people will be in jail by the time you're going to take your pension leave or by the time you're graduating maybe. Many years from now, they will still be locked, and like Chelsea Manning right now, I just heard, is again once in solitary confinement. Um, these people get a lot of attention when they are bringing out their leaks, and the fallout that follows afterwards. We look on the WikiLeaks, we look on, I don't know, Digitale Gesellschaft, we look on all the website, read about them, and then two years, three years, maybe five years later, we kind of move on with our lives. But these people are still in jail. And they shouldn't be there, they should be here with us today. And we know that they really appreciate to know that we are thinking about them and still think their work was really important for us. So what we did was we made two and a half thousand cards. I have a bunch of them here with me here. Uh, they're more at La Quadrature. But there is also here at the end of the tent, there's a little table. We have all the addresses there. And the one small, tiny thing you could do to show these people, to, to, know, uh, to let them know that we're still thinking about them, to show them your gratitude, is write them a card. They will really appreciate it. Um, small perk on the side is if we send all two and a half thousand, maybe we can also kind of like DDoS the German postal system in uh, due course. Please come uh, to the end of the tent or later to La Quadrature, write a card and free all the political prisoners in jail. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And a quick announcement. 
if you still want to hold a lightning talk tomorrow, you can still do that. You can submit your talk on the wiki, search for lightning talks, and then just send us a PDF with your slides, and we'll be very happy to host you and your talk tomorrow. Next up is uh, Tim, who was already here yesterday, talking about some more of his projects. Hi, I'm Tim. Um, next slide. Uh, that's me. Next slide. I'm from Australia. Uh, next slide. And I have too many projects. I also have too many slides. Next slide. I need help. I really need to sleep. Next slide. Uh, if you use Python, these two things should be good for you. Next slide. Um, if you use dates, use Python date time TZ. It will make your dates correct when you're going around the world. Next slide. Um, also use Q if you're tired and you're trying to debug something in production and print won't work. It's basically print on steroids. Next slide. I don't just like doing small projects. I also like doing uh, big projects. Next slide. Uh, Tim's video is basically a bunch of projects to do conference and video recording. Um, basically, we want to do what uh, the CCC here is doing, except without having you to be as smart as them. Next slide. Um, I've trained to develop a system in a box. Um, we need your help doing that. Next slide. Um, before uh, we stream it, though, you need good content. I can't help you make better content, but I can help you make better readable content. Next slide. Uh, so I developed a tool called SlideLint that actually tests your um, slides. Next slide. Uh, it's basically got a command line interface if you want to run it locally. Next slide. It has a website interface. Next slide. And it tells you whether your text is too close to the edge of the screen, whether it's low contrast, etc. Next slide. Um, so how do you do live streaming? Next slide. Uh, this is how you do it. Uh, the things in red are the parts I'm working on. Next slide. Uh, the first thing is you need to be able to capture the presentation. And so we're developing a piece of open source hardware called HTML USB. Um, it's based around FPGA. Next slide. Um, this is kind of where it fits in the system. Next slide. Uh, those two things there. Next slide. Um, there is two firmwares. There's an old firmware written in VHDL and Verilog. There's a new firmware written in Python. Next slide. Um, the new firmware is uh, really good. Um, I, it's much easier to work with than the old stuff. And next slide. Um, we also have developed open hardware because it doesn't matter if your firmware is open, if your hardware isn't. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we're uh, about to try and get these available. Um, you go to get Opus um, and you can get one. Next slide. Um, it has two HDMI in inputs, two HDMI outputs, display port in, display port out, USB, gigabit ethernet. It's great if you want to do some type of video stuff. Next slide. Um, it could also be used for other things rather than conference recording. If you're into like Milky Mist or Flickr noise or any of those type of things, would love for you to take a look at this board and see if you can do something interesting. Next slide. Um, we also want to support more boards than just our two. Um, if you're interested, come and chat to me. Uh, next slide. Uh, but once you've got it captured, you still need to mix it so that you can have the presenter and the um, uh, like slides and the video mixed. And so I developed a hardware system called G uh, software system called GST Switch. Next slide. Um, it's this bit here. It sits on the computer up the back. Next slide. Um, it's written in C. Uh, next slide. The CC guys didn't like that it was written in C, so they rewrote it in Python. Um, we are now seeing whether we can um, use that instead. So that's Voctomix. Next slide. Um, you also need to do encoding because on the um, cloud, there's not one supported format. Um, so, and you also need a website. So next slide. This is kind of the streaming system and where it sits. Next slide. Uh, we have basically an open source one of those. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. We would really love a graphics designer to come and make it look less ugly. Um, next slide. Uh, the front end is written in Django. The back end is written in uh, Flumotion and Python. Next slide. Um, the other thing, though, is even if you have all this content there and you have an awesome event, if nobody knows about it, then nobody comes. So next slide. I've also got a tool that publishes your event to all the popular social networks, including mailing lists and Facebook and Google+. Um, that needs a lot of love. It's in a little bit of disrepair. Next slide. 
And that is everything. Um, so just to reiterate, uh, Tim's video, uh, slide lint to check your slides, HDMI to USB to do capture, uh, GST switch or Voctomix for mixing, the streaming system for like the website stuff, and events everywhere to get your events everywhere. Thank you. <sighs> Perfectly on time. I have Thank too many you. projects. Don't forget your phone, please. And it was awesome. It was just on time. <laughs> Next up is uh, Peter Pötzi talking about his Kickstarter launch. Hi, uh, as this is my very first talk, I will make it in German. Hallo, um, ich bin der Peter. Okay. Uh, ich bin der Peter. Wir haben gestern, also Day 2 vom Camp, eine Kickstarter-Kampagne gestartet. Wir haben daran jetzt viele Monate gearbeitet und herausgekommen ist eben ein Produkt, das ist ein Fahrradmotor, den kann man auf jedem Fahrrad montieren. Der schaltet sich mechanisch genau dann zu, wenn man wirklich auch mit einem E-Bike fahren will und sonst hängt er runter und erzeugt keinen Widerstand. Das haben wir gestern gestartet. Wir haben mittlerweile schon 13.000 Euro eingenommen, also an Spenden gesammelt auf Kickstarter. Um, next slide. <lacht> um, das ist eigentlich ein animiertes GIF, hat aber PDF jetzt nicht überlebt. Der Motor wird einfach so in das Fahrrad reingesteckt. Und er klappt dann mechanisch nach oben, sobald man anfängt zu treten und schiebt dann mit bis zu 800 Watt mit an. Ähm, wir haben das gestern erst auf Kickstarter veröffentlicht und wir haben ziemlich viele Fragen bekommen. Eigentlich war es immer die gleiche Frage, nämlich kann ich das auch auf meinem Fahrrad montieren? Wir haben das dann in der FAQ auch so geedit und ja, die meisten Leute sind dann eben zufrieden damit. Ähm, next slide. Was dann als allererstes passiert ist und was wir überhaupt nicht erwartet haben, wir sind irgendwie zwei Stunden, nachdem wir das veröffentlicht haben, auf CNET gelandet und zwar auf CNET Japan. Also wir verstehen dort kein Wort. Laut Google Translate haben die sich offenbar die Mühe gemacht, unsere Kampagne zusammenzufassen. Sie haben da auch Screenshots von unserem Video veröffentlicht. Von unseren 30 Bakern kommen aber allerdings nur drei aus Japan jetzt durch das CNET. Man sieht auch, also CNET hat unser Video eingebunden. Fast die Hälfte von unseren Video Views kommt direkt von dieser Seite, allerdings auch nur 10% der Baker. Ähm, wir haben auch Google Analytics verwendet, wo man eben sieht, von wo die Leute kommen. Also das Blaue, das heißt, die kommen direkt von Kickstarter. Und nur ein ganz kleiner Teil wird eben von externen News-Seiten weitergeleitet. Die meisten Leute haben unsere Kampagne einfach dadurch gefunden, dass sie irgendwie Kategorie Neueste oder Popular in wo auch immer geklickt haben. Aber man sieht auch, von wo die meisten Leute kommen, nämlich USA. Offenbar ist Kickstarter dort am meisten verbreitet und Japan. Ich selbst bin aus Österreich, aus Graz, bin auch gegenüber im Leihwandwill, falls mich jemand besuchen will. Und ja, ich würde mich freuen, wenn ihr vorbeischaut. Und unser größtes Problem auf der Kampagne, was ich bisher gesehen habe, also wir haben zwar recht viele Besucher, die meisten Besucher verlassen die Seite allerdings auch nach 10 Sekunden wieder, deswegen haben wir erst 30 Baker. Wie wir die Kampagne selbst aufgesetzt haben, wäre eigentlich ein Talk für sich und vielleicht sehen wir uns dann auf dem Kongress wieder. Danke. Thanks very much. We might still have time for questions. How is it called? What? How is it called? The project, how is it called? It is called GoE. The website is go-e.bike. You can support me on Kickstarter. <laughs> Another question? No? Okay, then, thank you very much. Next up is Anus, who... You're not Anus. But you're talking about uh, the fish thing? Oh, yeah, fish thing. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Hello? Oh. Hello? Yeah. Um, so, my name is Daniel, I work as a chef uh, in Sweden, and... Uh, One inch to the front of the mic. Here? Okay, yeah, sorry. My name is Daniel, I come from the Swedish Embassy with support from the Fest. And I'm going to talk about Sushtraming, which is soured herring. Um, the reason why I, talk, uh, why I have this speech is to uh, inform everyone about this very beautiful tradition that we have in the north of Sweden. So here we go. Uh, Surströmming is a lightly salted uh, Baltic Sea uh, herring. Um, and it's just enough salt to not let it rot. Um, so the fermentation is um, 
Uh, and autolysis is uh, fermentation, uh, and along with bacteria, it makes a really, really hard smell, which I think is really good, but most people hate it. Ah, oh, oh, sorry. Um, let's see. And uh, thank you. Uh, the history of this is uh, really kind of unknown, uh, but. Um, uh, due to war times in the 16th century, uh, we couldn't use as much salt as we wanted, so we used as little salt as possible, and then we got, well, sous And um, uh, then we put it in big wooden barrels, which still do today, and uh, we let it ferment for around six months uh, until it's ready, uh, re around the third Thursday in August. Um, and most people uh, maybe have seen like videos from YouTube uh, where they eat those fillets like whole. Uh, you should never do that. You should eat it with uh, thin crisp potatoes and uh, uh, the herring along with the chopped onions traditionally. And then you can add the sour cream. Um, let's see here. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, there's actually a, a court case in German from the 1981 uh, that one tenant in an apartment uh, smeared sushramming all over the apartment and got evicted. And later uh, in court um, was uh, terminated because the jury had smelled the sushramming and thought that, well, this is reasonable. So, thank you, Germany. Uh, 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 let's see here. And... Uh, yes, in a moment. How much time? Two minutes. Oh, nice. So, uh, talking about the fermentation, uh, in the fish bones, uh, there's a lactic, lactic acid that starts to ferment. And in combination with bacteria, that creates the really, really strong smell. Um, and if you're interested in this, and interested to taste this, we have one can with us, which will be enough for plenty of people to share, uh, and we will serve it the correct way. Uh, in the Swedish embassy, around, uh, what is this, six, I think? Six. Uh, we'll go someplace safe. I wish I could have it with me here, but uh, we would be banned from CCC for the rest of our lives. So, I can't do that. But uh, please welcome. Uh, you're all welcome. Thank you. Thanks. We, we, we still, still have, have a question. question. Please go to the microphone for the question. This. Oh. Yeah. So, is it true that at this Sustroming tasting you will also offer traditional Swedish alcohol? Oh, I completely forgot. Yes, we have snaps, and it's not schnapps, it's snaps, uh, which we'll serve. And you should traditionally also drink it with light beer, and we're here in German, so thank you. So come join us at this Swedish embassy at 6 in 15 minutes. You can get drunk and watch people eat fermented fish. Yes. I, I also have a question. Yeah. How, uh, how does the Swedish embassy currently get along with its neighbors? Sorry? Uh, we, we thought of opening it close to the Danes, but that would uh, almost be... That would be racist, actually. Because <laughs> that would probably be taken as a, something very... Well, evil to them. So, uh, final note, if you want to find the Swedish Embassy, we're right next to the Danes, and they have huge Danish flags and shit. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, please come by and talk more about the fermentation process, which I couldn't cover around like this five minutes. So, thank you. Thank you. And before we're coming to our last lightning talk, I would like to ask you all to submit lightning talks for tomorrow. We still have plenty of open spots. You can talk about your favorite project that you did at home, that you did at your hackerspace, that you're doing in politics or at school. 
really anywhere where you're doing a group project and would want to talk about it in front of a large crowd, get contributors, just tell people what they should or shouldn't do. <laughs> Please submit a lightning talk. The instructions like are all on the wiki. You just need to send us your PDF with slides, and we'll be happy to host you tomorrow. Thank you. OK. Don't move too much. The microphone is quiet. Hello. I'm Kate. I'm staying in the open data camp. And over the past couple of days, we've come up with a few songs that might be familiar to you, but in a, a new version that addresses more kind of chaos topical themes. So I thought I'd share two of them and say that we're still in this process of making up songs. So if you have ideas for fun melodies or things you'd like to hear on the ukulele, uh, come find me. So the first one is called NSA. Good? Okay. NSA. All my data seems to flow your way It's like every little thing I say You store away Oh, NSA BND You've lost the trust of Germany There's a shadow hanging over me And it is you Oh, BND Why they had to know we don't know, you wouldn't say You did something wrong when you gave our data away NSA You're running out of games to play And you're too big now to hide away Oh, we can see you, NSA Zugabe? <laughs> Wollt ihr eine Zugabe? <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was, that was a little note, um, yes, to the NSA. And so on a more uplifting topic, here's uh, Liberate Your Data, which is the, I, th I think so far, the official open data <laughs> camp song. So uh, it's called CS, well, it's Liberate Your Data, CSV. And feel free to sing along if you, if you get the gist of it. And, and you know, wave lighters if you're into burning things down. <laughs> when I find myself in times of trouble, open data comes to me. Whisper words of wisdom, CSV. And in my hour of darkness, I have files that machines can read, delimited with commas, CSV. CSV, 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 oh CSV, liberate your data, CSV, a CSV, 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 oh CSV, liberate your data, CSV. And even hostile file formats like PDFs and PPTs, we will scrape your tables, CSV. Locked away on corporate servers, we demand transparency. Liberate your data, CSV. A CSV, 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 oh CSV. Liberate your data, CSV. CSV, CSV. CSV, oh CSV, liberate your data with appropriate provisions for privacy, such as anonymization, the removal of identifying information. CSV. Oh, what, what, what a finish for the second lightning talk session. This was really, really great. 
So I would like to thank every speaker who was here. I would like to thank Seefischer and Zeltofiel for organizing this stuff. I would like to thank the video and all the people for doing all the stuff. And last but not least, we have a live translation team here, which is really, really great. So please give to all these people a big round of applause. That's Zeltofiel.